Um, so I know some of you have kind of gotten a sense of some of the discussion that's been happening uh, so far over the last day anyway. Um, but essentially we're, we're starting to, we, we've had a, a day of, of academic research discussion around the intersections of young people, mental health, gaming, live streaming, and esports. Esports has been sort of more of a, a predominant theme, to be honest, uh, in this symposium so far. I think it, it's um, important in this discussion to not be completely tied down in empiricism. It's equally valid at this point to kind of bring in industry leaders and say, well, you know, what are your perspectives on, on this key issue of, of youth mental health, you know, within your respective industries? Uh, perhaps we could kind of just sort of start um, and, and by all means, you know, feel free to jump in at any point. It, it, this isn't going to be like a, a one after the other kind of discussion. But perhaps we can kind of start with, you know, from an industry perspective, uh, what are your experiences of mental health issues facing young athletes, you know, in, in terms of esports, for example, that you're aware of? You know, where, where is industry at um, currently in the discussion? Um, I'll, I'll jump in then. I was happy to start. <laughs> um, yeah, mental health is it's a huge issue. Like when I talk about mental health, I'll talk about Scotland really because that's um that's my remit. That's the sort of area I know. And yeah, there's a huge mental health in Scotland across all ages, quite frankly, um, that me and my friends have lived experience of. And yeah, it's something that I think needs to get tackled at the social level, um, apart from any other level. Um, and yeah, that's um that I think that's what a lot of people have been talking about today is that social level, like because at the private level, uh yeah, you've got your three sectors, obviously, public, uh private and the third sector. And in general, the public sector is about money because that's where your profits come from. Uh private public sector is about power, litigation, all that stuff. But everyone always forgets about the third sector, the sector with charities and social enterprises in it. Um, the actual sector that is designed for social change. And the people, the reason people forget about that sector is because it's not based on money. Like um, social enterprises, profits are not based on money, they're based on the social impact you do. And I think looking at that sector, um, that's where you can start solving a lot of these mental health problems. Like, and it's it's weird because we all talk about these mental health problems, but it's no one's fault in particular. Like, it's um, you can't really sort of pinpoint it on one um one problem i think it's just the sort of culture of esports really and that's quite a wide phrase saying that but in scotland for instance esports there's no regulation there's no governance there's no support and there's a huge awareness problem like i always quantified the awareness problem in scotland that people are unaware of how unaware they are of the awareness of the awareness of esports in scotland and yeah, the grassroots gets hit the most with that, especially like volunteers and young people as well. Like young people, uh, it's what um, was mentioned in the previous keynote, like young people are playing these video games for like eight hours a day thinking they're going to be an esports player. And like most people can run, not everyone's a runner. Like if you want to, if you play a game for eight hours a day, chances are you're not going to become an esports player. You're going to get very good at the game. Like you're going to get very, very good at the game, but you're not necessarily going to transition into playing it like that. And people don't know that. Like kids don't like they don't have awareness around this. And yeah, I think awareness is really the biggest thing that anyone can do for mental health, really, and especially in esports. So, do you, do you think then that? Um, youth anxieties are starting to emerge. One of the things we talked about yesterday afternoon was this idea that being an esports athlete or a live streamer or a professional gamer are increasingly becoming quite um, desirable career paths for young people. Um, do you think that there's an emergent kind of anxiety that, that comes with this sort of like unmet expectations perhaps that young people are seeing these high level athletes um, and gamers who have made it to the top and, and have developed their audiences and such. Um, and then that creates like stresses and anxieties for young people in terms of, well, why aren't I reaching those pinnacles? And, and that then ends up becoming like a negative sort of thing. And, and if so, what do you think could start to be done about that? Do you think that it's a case of schools perhaps need to start taking this seriously, that this is a, an increasingly popular career path that young people want to involve in? And so there needs to be more, you know, training and education around 
um, I, I guess, you know, managing young people's desires and, and, and kind of guiding them down those right paths just so that those sort of unrealistic expectations are formed. And, and again, by any means, if anyone else wants to join in on this, then, then jump in. Um, yeah, definitely. Like, um, it's, um, sorry, I just jumped in there if anyone else wants to <laughs> just yeah. jump in. Uh, definitely. Like, um, I remember reading a book that had, it was all about, um, it was like a research book and it had all these different experiments in it. And in the sixties, they'd done an experiment where they got, um, young people and asked them what they need to succeed in life. And in the sixties, they all answered community and families and your friends around them. And then they'd done the same experiment in the 2010s and every single kid wanted to be an influencer and they just, they thought in order to get ahead in life, they had to be famous basically. And that's just the society we live in right now, like because of social media and because we're all so connected and like, uh, like privacy, like we talk about privacy and stuff, but Twitter, we literally put messages out to the entire world every day. And that has this effect on these young people and at SEH, like, um, the, plug time <laughs> uh the social enterprise i'm starting is um called scottish esports hub and it's based around esports careers well-being and networking and we've got a skills program planned and one of the things we're going to do with the skills program is to because i know as soon as we go in there all the kids will want to be youtubers twitch players but there's over a hundred careers in esports like especially in the creative arts sector like the creative arts is a one-to-one -one crossover with esports, stuff like video editor, um, stage producer, graphic artist, and then you've got the like esports literally crosses over with every single industry. And most of these careers you can already do at university. Like if you want to be a graphic artist, for instance, you can go to university and study that and get a degree in it, and then go into esports after it. So I think it's it's awareness again. It's making all these kids aware that. Yeah, I the glitz and glamour and all the stuff you see is amazing, but behind that there's all these operations staff and there's all these people that have a that have put their their careers in basically to make this happen. And yeah, I think it, it does all come down to awareness at the end of the day. I think. Yeah, I I mean I definitely definitely agree with that. And like this social enterprise that you've got going, I, I'd love to chat about man because that that is that's a huge problem in the industry. The esports industry has a lot of problems <laughs> and challenges and ultimately a lot of the time um it comes down to resources right and the reason that um orgs organizations whether that's like top tier teams tos whatever um are they should or could be doing this absolutely i'm sure they're conscious of it but oftentimes it is a resources problem not that that's an excuse especially with them um, with big topics like this that need to be uh, paid far more attention to, but it is at least a reason, right? And there, there is a reason that's not happening more. But I, I personally think it, it is a big problem in the industry, um, an industry that is quite heavily reliant, oftentimes, at least on a lower tier, um, on volunteer workforces, like employee care and employee wellbeing programs are incredibly important and very, very needed. But oftentimes, like these small companies or smaller companies in the esports space, don't have like they. I'm sure again, at least mostly, they're all well intentioned, but they're under resourced generally, and they don't know who to turn to. So like that, that your style man sounds great. Like there's a company um, that Eunice Chen has been in the space for a few years now has started recently called Inlight dot gg. So e n l i g h t dot gg. And they're very focused on the mentorship side um, and also offering people uh, in the early stage of their careers opportunities in the space. And I think with mental health more specifically, we're like, we're getting there. But yeah, I think it has to come from a top down approach. Like what Trisha, as one example, um, who's the CEO at FlyQuest, what she's doing and what they're doing at FlyQuest, I think is fantastic. And like, that kind of thing is very much a part of their ethos and one of the points that they want to drive home in terms of looking after their people and such. Um, I think like last week or something, the, the CSPPA, the Counter-Strike Players Association, partnered with, um, I believe it's a mental health focused charity or program. So essentially to offer those services um, to the players that are part of the association. I think that again, like that is 
like that's great and like that's a start but like that's only just happened right and that's just in csgo and again it's a problem with esports that it's one typically fairly under resourced or a lot of companies are um and two that like esports is so broad and it exists across multiple ecosystems and also as we know it's fairly unregulated unregulated which is both i guess uh good and bad right but yeah i think there's positive signs that um like changes come in with this kind of thing again it's just another thing where it's like esports needs to grow up a bit i guess but again it's that resources problem and yeah what you're saying as well about like governmental support and such i think that will be huge huge in making those changes i think this is a good uh segue mm-hmm. to, to bring Stephen into the discussion um in his role with the esports integrity commission and, and Stephen, i know that essay um is pr- primarily involved with um anti-doping so um I presume, you know, performance enhancements um, and, uh, in, in terms of match fixing and whatnot, which interestingly, you know, obviously was touched upon by Emma in her keynote. Um, but something that Sam just mentioned then made me think of you in, in terms of um, there being a lack of regulation generally. Um, and I wonder where you see some something like the Esports Integrity Commission having more recognition or, or more ability to kind of or organi- organizations like yours to, to kind of come into these spaces and, and to kind of try and have some sort of policy or some kind of guidelines um, what are your thoughts on that yeah it's really uh, it's a really interesting topic the reason why it's interesting uh, is because it's, it's quite timely um, so of course with us in our operations we we do uh, undertake a lot of work regarding um, compromise integrity in the sport or in, in esports um, and um, that, that compromise uh, generally would, would come about in either match fixing as you correctly mentioned um, or doping or some sort of cheating um, these things are our primary sort of mandate um, however a, a core pillar of ours is, is youth protection uh, among you know three pillars in total one of our core core pillars is youth protection um, and what we've noticed is, especially recently, as we've as we've uh, undertaken some very high-profile investigations with with law enforcement um, that have impacted, you know, uh, large groups of of people, um, we've noticed that there is a an element of 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 the task um, that that is being overlooked, and that is sort of that that mental health element um, when when we when we're sanctioning sort of younger people, especially. Uh, effectively ending careers, um, issuing a five-year ban or issuing a three-year ban, or whatever it may be, which in esports terms is a doomsday sentence, as you as you probably know. Um, we 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 have to we we've had to now start thinking more carefully about the impacts of of those actions, despite the fact that they're rightful, despite the fact that they are correctly charged in in that way. Uh, it doesn't mean that you we it doesn't mean that we take joy in doing it. Um, of course, there is a there is a mental mental toll or a mental cost to uh, affecting integrity in, in the esports ecosystem. So, um, we're, we're becoming a, a alive to that. I guess started happening probably about a year or so ago. So, what we started doing immediately is um, we started to uh, discuss this topic with uh, some very large, uh, some very very large international esports stakeholders. Um, and then we brought government in uh, to the discussion, um, uh, specifically the U.S. government, um, who seem to be probably the most uh, receptive uh, to this to this to this concept at the moment. Um, now, in collaboration with these uh, larger organisations and with government, we've we've progressed the discussion over the course of sort of twelve months. It's a very slow moving process to to now uh, reach a stage where we're we've we've put together and put forward a proposal for a esports safeguarding body. Um, now the esports safeguarding body uh, will, will have quite a few different roles, but primarily among all those roles will be youth protection. Um, now that that essentially is our sort of uh, strategic perspective on the issue. Uh, it, it is that there in fact does need to be a safeguarding body for esports. Of course, I'm not necessarily going to say that uh, it's going to answer all the questions and then it's going to solve all the problems, but I think it's definitely a starting point. Um, and we're, we're exploring that still even till now very, very carefully 
And again, as Sam correctly mentioned, um, look, the biggest problem in, e in esports is under-resourced uh, entities that are just finding commercialization. They're understanding, they're just starting to understand how to commercialize, they're just understanding how to, to actually uh, stay afloat uh, in the midterm to long term, especially weathering things like COVID and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, so these these organizations don't even know of themselves, especially when it's not their primary function. They don't have the cap capacity generally to to think about this this stuff, which is, you know, unfortunately, in a barely commercializable environment, uh, it's sometimes considered a luxury to think about. So we've had to bring in stakeholders that have deeper pockets, um, that have sort of a, a, a larger sort of ability to to contribute to the ecosystem, uh, and then sort of unite them under a singular rationale. Um, uh, with the government support, of course, because as soon as you, you bring in government support, you also tie in industry. Uh, and now the last thing to do is to bring in academic support, really, <clears throat> into the into the equation. Because, of course, um, we, we definitely want to, to, to understand this as a matter of academia as opposed to just a, an industry only um, sort of sort of uh, approach, because we want longevity in this in this in this initiative. So that, that's that's a really brief um, uh, synopsis on on where we are strategically regarding uh, mental health in esports. No, it's it's good. I mean, how do you envision a partnership between academia and industry working in in terms of uh, in the context of supporting you know, people? Do you, do you see it as a as a matter of um, awareness raising? So if, you know, even right down to the level of uh, helping to educate young people to be aware that you know um, that there is that kind of jump between uh, gaming as a ledger activity and gaming uh, as a career and the um, the complications or, or, or the implications of um, involvement in this industry in a professional context versus in that leisure context. So, for example, in uh, Emma's keynote from before, um, there was a screenshot of someone who had been completely deplatformed, essentially, from, from competitive esports, and, and you touched upon it as well. Um, and I wonder if there's, you know, whether it's down to confusion. So, for example, um, young young people who struggle with um, autism spectrum disorder or, or ADHD and might take either, uh, you know, Adderall or Ritalin or Dexamphetamine as a, as a like, uh, for medicinal uses, then end up winding up being banned for, for doping in essence. Um, you know, whether it's whether it's a case of, you know, awareness raising in, in terms of the implications of, of that aspect or if it's, you know, awareness raising in terms of, um, codes of conduct, you know, j just kind of like shifting that that mentality from gaming as as kind of like fun and play to gaming as you know professional career option. Um, and, and again, like this is an open floor for for response. But, but obviously, like so, I mean, thing. yeah. So, so I mean, um, I, I think something that esports does really well is um, listen to itself. Um, I think sometimes we find I find that that esports as an industry is a bit of an echo chamber um, for a variety of reasons. Look, it's it's been a very long road, and I'm I'm definitely very appreciative of being let in to to the industry to the extent that I have been. Um, but I think that there is a lot of there is a lot of importance, especially when it comes to issues such as uh, mental health, where you have young kids that are sub subjecting you know being subjected to large amounts of pressure uh, it's really important to transcend that echo chamber um, and, and that's where i think academia plays a very important role um, moving things beyond the industry uh, and, and into mainstream is a key component of any solution um, if, a, if, if, a, if a problem is only heard on the inside of a machine that is barely built uh, it's it's going to be very very difficult for for anything really to change so i think that's that's Primarily, where I think academia plays a role in the sense that uh, it allows that problem to come and become become obvious and evident in, in, in the mainstream, you know, by by the results of academia. Um, regarding the the example that you gave, so in that situation in specifics, I understand the concept and the principle that you were trying to point out, but that in that specific in instance, there would be a therapeutic use exemption, so there wouldn't be a uh, there wouldn't be an issue with that particular individual. Um, but but I understand the concept, which is which is that it's, it, it is inevitable that regardless of um, regardless of sort of uh, whatever it is that we do, it, there is a reality which is that you know if, if you're banning somebody for five years, you are ending effectively ending all that hard work they've put into you know becoming that that esports athlete, and that's definitely something that 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 needs to be covered. And we believe that that that's generally going to be assisted 
not not solved, but at least mitigated in some capacity by a well-funded safeguarding organization that is looking at that particular risk all the time, that is op opening itself and its services to those people that are affected in that way. So what happens when, when a young esports athlete or, or aspiring athlete is, is banned and essentially kind of like ruled out uh, in, in terms of the after effects? Um, you know, you, you, you think about professional um, traditional sports athletes, for example, that are that have lost their jobs or they've been medically retired or whatever organizations responsible for them typically will provide some kind of mental health support um in the case of these young people who, are, who who've had their careers ended um either through inadvertent or direct actions from your experience is there a lot of support for these young people or are they effectively kind of like cast out on their own Look, they, they are, unfortunately so, yeah. They are effectively cast out on their own. And that, that tends to be more and more the case, the lower and lower level of competition that you go. Um, so we had an instance recently where we sanctioned or issued sanctions against 42 Australian players. They're all, all from a fairly low level competition. Um, and the, the reality of, of the facts of the matter were, were that they were, in fact, in breach of certain... Uh, certain um, program uh, specifics in our integrity program, specifically in the anti-corruption code. But the reality of the situation is because there's su it's such a low, lower level of competition, um, there, there isn't that sort of luxurious support that you'd get from a multi-billion dollar tier one organization that has your sort of sports psychologists and all that sort of stuff built into the team roster. Um, so, so, you know, they, these people end up basically having to rely on their friends uh, rely on people that they, you know, that they acquainted with, uh, and that's not something that anybody takes happiness or joy in. It's it's definitely a, a sad situation. So I found myself like personally on the phone with these guys because they're Australian and I'm Australian. So I found myself personally on the phone with these guys, coaching coaching them through it and um, sort of giving them some some advice and and, and telling them, look, you know, just because you got a speeding ticket doesn't mean you're a terrible human being. Like it's 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 not it's not a reflection of you as a human, and and, and I think that that's a very um, baseline like uh, uh, attempt at rectifying that that particular issue which needs to be dealt with professionally um, so so uh, that, that that's that's my uh, my experience of it can I ask uh, Felipe Borges uh, I can see you're here I was wondering if you had any experiences of, of, of any of this is we're discussing and and Josephine I want to also bring you into the discussion yeah hundred percent I have several topics that I want to highlight throughout yes. for discuss but I was kind of waiting for for you know the not steer too too far away from the discussion so I think um, the, the first thing that I, I like to highlight was um, this is my own uh, perspective, which is esports kind of divides in, into has an industry kind of divides in two main main aspects. We have the competitive side and we have the entertainment side, and I think those are two very uh, they they are very intertwined, but at the same time they have their distinctions. The reason why I say this is uh, because a lot of the issues that have been brought up here, you know, in terms of mental health and and in terms of players, they're not necessarily just unique to esports, right? These are also present in traditional sports, and and it's very interesting to see why they're a bit more prevalent in esports than potentially traditional sports or they're more up to discussion and i think there's uh, some fundamental uh, points to, to highlight there one of them is you know the social aspect we as a as a species right we're very sociable when we're practicing sports uh, or tradition more traditional sports we have a very you know kind of clear progression path which is what in esports is so commonly referred to as the path to pro and it's something that you know more and more um, organizations are trying to define and, and clear out and make sure that you know it is clear because in traditional sports the path to pro is quite clear, right? You join your your local team, you start playing there, you progress, you get the mentorship, you get kind of get you know that team environment, and then you evolve through that. If you're good enough, you get scouted, you go to the next club, probably on the city, the bigger city close away, and then so on and so forth, and you kind of progress. So it's very clear, um, and and the only barrier of entry is pretty much you joining that local club. That's how it works. In esports, this doesn't happen. It has pros and cons, obviously, because. There's the barrier to entry is also very reduced. I just literally need a computer and a connection to the internet, and I can, you know, compete with some of the best in the world uh, at the comfort of my own house. But at the same time, I feel, once again, personal opinion, that you are excluded from that very important team environment that gets built up. One of the things that I notice, uh, not only from a coach to uh, now a team owner as well, and being involved in the industry for a long time, uh, was that we are dealing with a lot of players who, you know, I'd consider them 
obviously young, but not as young as, you know, when people start playing traditional sports when they're 16 and they should have an idea of what it is to work on a team environment. You know, there are all those um, values that get built up from you playing traditional sports. They don't translate in the same way for esports. Uh, and this is something that I think it's quite important and that it's definitely not an issue that's easy to tackle because once again, esports has or, or competitive video games have a lot of pros in regards to, you know, allowing everyone and anyone to play them, but then they're not necessarily, we're not necessarily doing a good job of creating and educating these young people on a lot of the values that they have and pick up from, from traditional sports. So, and the reasons why even uh, a lot of, you know, uh, pediatricians and, and, and parents put their kids into team sports is precisely to teach them those values. Work with other human beings, get to know, you create friendships, you you evolve as a as a, a person, you grow. And I think in esports, that sector is very, um, let's call it removed let, uh, from the actual experience of playing a game. Furthermore, I think the actual experience of playing a game it tends to be a bit more harsh because we have the anonymous. Uh, ah, sorry, you are anonymous when you're playing video games. Apologies for that. Uh, and what it ends up happening is that we have that toxicity that's inherent to uh, the internet, right? Everyone is anonymous. We can, uh, and uh, I think there's a lot of frustration that gets built up as well in specific video games, in competitive ones, where you don't really know those people. So it's not like you going to play football in a field with a couple of randoms as well but you can actually see those people. It's a lot more difficult for you to get upset at someone who you're actually interacting as a human than to someone who, you know, just pops into your game. You have no context or how the day is. You know, they might be having a very stressful situation. They're playing a game and then you're kind of, you know, getting frustrated with them as well. And that kind of has a ripple effect, right? Because even if you're having an amazing day and you're having a really good set of games, if one game, if one uh, player ruins your game on that specific moment, then that can make you frustrated, which then makes you ruin someone else's game and so on and so forth. Um, so that's the, the probably the first point that I want to highlight, which is and why a lot of you know video game developers and and companies that are directly trying to create an esports ecosystem, where they're trying to create this path to pro, but I think we're still a long way off to kind of giving that um, value creation and, and creating future athletes in in, in the, the what tr traditional sports do when they do well, right? Which is that creating those values, creating that communal. Um, team spirit that carries on really well and not to say that they don't still have you know players that are a bit you know rougher or frustration still happen it's a competitive environment so these will always happen it's just having that that mentorship and people who are older you know the coaching staff that is pretty much ingraining really good values on you from the ground up and that doesn't happen in sports the vast majority of players usually they play loads of games uh, as it was mentioned here for like eight hours a day and uh, sometimes even more um, and then you know they just pick up a lot of habits, habits, once again, that are not being mentored or, you know, um, or advised. And then they reach the age of around 16 and they tend to get put into a competitive team. And that's, you know, when the, all those issues start to be, you know, quite apparent. And that's when they start getting support at the age of 16, as opposed to traditional sports when this happens, you know, from the age of two, four, six, eight, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's the first point that I want to highlight. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, the social aspect is also very important. Path to Pro is definitely something that I think needs to be worked on. And I think there needs to be a middle term between, you know, having this barrier to entry removed where anyone can pretty much pick up a game. If they're really good, they're going to pop up in the top rankings and be potentially picked up by a team. But at the same time, those grassroots structures need to be there. Those, you know, lower divisions that are kind of building the support structure to um, to be able to uh, develop new talent in the right framework. Um, I think this is in inherently a problem of a very nascent industry. Um, Esports as an industry uh, from both the competitive and entertainment side is relatively new. Um, it's 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 a question of time, to be honest, in my perspective, because we'll need, you know, experienced veteran players to start, you know, to coach newer players. And this will do a ripple down effect and go down in a way on the pyramid and until you kind of reach those lower levels. Because as it stands, the vast majority of supporting staff for the grassroots um, scene ends up being not people who have actually experienced competition on a high level or have the values to be able to support that they end up being just people who like to get involved and they're willing to draw a hand so you know that's not being addressed at the lower level um and i think the other one is you know overall regarding mental health it's it's i think it's necessarily a bit bigger than esports i think it has to do with you know how humans are interacting with each other more nowadays and it has that uh, uh social element it has that um kind of 
dopamine release effect of you know getting more likes and that's why people are seeing you know that that has a career path later on i mean i have young cousins and they all say they want to be either a professional video game or an influencer this is pretty much the, the desired career path and there's a reason for it right previously it used to be football player um you know when when i was younger most of my friends wanted to be football players right um so i think that's just paradigm shift to be honest um those are the new celebrities in a way um i don't think it's necessarily bad to want to aspire to be one but it's it's more on us you know to kind of explain to them that you know once again the the reason why they're famous it's because they're the top one percent and and not everyone will eventually reach the top one percent so it's it's i think then it shifts very well into the academia side where we need to create those career paths and i think a lot of the times, one of the problems with academia as a whole is we're trying to ship stuff just to, you know, oh, this is an esports thing. When in reality, my honest opinion is that, you know, esports has an industry, as I mentioned, we have the competitive industry, which is not new, just a different medium. Instead of we're competing on traditional sports, we're competing on a different medium instead of being a pitch, it's now on a, a virtual sense. And at the same time, we have the entertainment one, which is also not new. And we will need all the same people that we need previously right i mean i run esports projects we need makeup artists we need videographers we need um some of the the roles do change for example an observer for a video game is not necessarily a role that you used to have before uh but but other than those very specific ones the replay ops the graphics ops you know the streaming engineers all these things they exist in traditional industries so it's it's making more people realize that you know we do need um as i mentioned though that supporting structure from very different areas. And, you know, you can be an accountant and work in esports. You can be a lawyer and work I in I think this is what Brian was uh, uh, making the mm -hmm. point very forces, like there's a hundred mm -hmm. careers here, but people focus on the visibility, the, the, the yeah. super, yeah, the super celebrities, yes. Mm -hmm. It's the same Joyce in traditional sports, right? Where everyone wants to be a footballer, no one thinks of, mm -hmm. yeah, who is actually making the broadcast happen or, you know, who is the supporting staff within the, the the team right that usually ends up being uh, we used to have a joke a lot where, where, within the production where you have a lot of uh, frustrated uh, potentially rock uh, band members where they end up being an audio engineer right or because you, you're not good enough to potentially play in a band right but you still have the love for the the, the, the activity right or the love for the music so you end up contributing to it in a different way. And I think that's probably the, the most, I mean, I, I wasn't good enough to be a, a player now, that's why I run projects, right? Uh, so so that, I think it's very important to kind of highlight that. But I think it's also good that people want to aspire to be the best, but just know that, you know, if you can't be, there's a, a whole range of options where you still can contribute positively to the, the ecosystem. Sorry. I think that's starting to happen now. I know that as esports academic programs at universities mm -hmm. where you can now, there are various institutions, particularly here in the UK and around the mm -hmm. world, where they're starting to introduce esports uh, programs as degrees. Um, and I think they're starting to have that discussion where they're, they're starting to say, mm -hmm. look, you know, this is, you know, learn about events management, learn about production and so on. Um, but I think Athena and I are on the same page that it'd be good to bring in Josephine at this point um, and, and get her, her view on this um, as someone who kind of works directly with, with young people. Um, what have this discussion so far resonated with, with um, yourself and, and I see Susanna's just um, uh, come online as well. Um, you know, for the both of you, like where, where do you, what are your experiences as, as people who directly work with young people that, that have kind of expressed either interests or experiences of mental health uh, in this? Sure. Well, I can um, give you my 2P and I can pass over to my lovely colleague, Susanna, um, who works in, um, in the Insights team. I work in the Partnerships team. Moving a little bit away from eSports, I, I think I'm probably the odd one out, but where we work for a youth charity called Diana Award. Shout out to all the youth board members in the room. I see you. Um, and I think what, what really resonated from what Philippe said, and thank you, Athena, as well, um, was around uh, value exchange and creating those uh, supportive environments. So um, I think also as a charity like we're coming at it from a very different perspective in a lot of ways but as a charity I think you know awareness raising is good but awareness raising for the sake of awareness raising is um 
not necessarily quantifiable. So we work largely, well, the work that I develop in a uh, live streaming space, which is the reason why I'm here with you today, focuses more on um, the young people who exist in communities that streamers manage online, um, how we can reach those young people, how we can better support um, content creators and streamers to cultivate a safe and uh, inclusive online environment. So there are a few different ways we've we've tried to attack this that all sits alongside um, what we do with streamers uh, as far as charity streams go, so fundraising. Um, we've developed, you know, we're listening to them and we're learning from them because we're, although we're experts in anti-bullying and in a lot of issues that surround young people, we're not necessarily an expert in this in this brand new space. So I think learning from members of those communities, listening to what they need, they outlined they wanted more resources for their to look after their own well-being and to support uh, other young people um, within their communities who are struggling. Um, they wanted guidance on how to talk about difficult topics, especially if you're working with um, an anti-bullying charity, even though you are maybe playing games primarily, uh, if someone confides in you, if someone said like something comes up in chat, making sure that we can safeguard both the content creator and, and the young people who are a part um, of, of that online event, whatever it may look like. Um, we also developed a training session um, which is aimed specifically at content creators, like I said, to uh, help them to embed not only the values of, of anti-bullying, but also safety and inclusivity in those streams. And um, we saw from uh, our evaluation on that project that they did feel more, all of them collectively felt, 100% uh, of them felt more able to talk about those issues, more able to identify these negative behaviours as they're happening, more able to know where to sign support, signpost support to uh, a person or to support them themselves. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, while I definitely see the burnout, I see the, the mental health issues that um, that go along with that. And as a charity, we, we have to be, be very thorough in how we exercise due diligence around that. Um, I also see, especially over the past year, how these communities have become spaces of connection, of community, of belonging, of friendship, of like-minded individuals. These are, you know, they're not random as in a football field. These people are, uh, they matter to each other. And um, it's certainly, it's certainly for us a two-sided coin. So while the issues that we tackle as a charity occur in these spaces those spaces are also the spaces that young people go to when they are experiencing those same issues perhaps in other aspects of their lives and that, that's a really important uh, thing um, that uh, we, we talked you know already about the diverse career field within these you know gaming spaces whether it's esports or, or live streaming but the idea that um, whether you're, you know, if you're an esports athlete that has a large following or if you're, you know, a streamer with a large following, um, you can simultaneously be a gamer and also be expected to be like a mental health service provisioner acting in like a very pastoral role. Um, you know, people will donate and say, look, I'm having a really hard time, but your stream or your, you know, whatever it is, your community is, has really helped me. Um, I think that, 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 again, is something that hasn't really factored into the discussion so far, that the role that, that young people are increasingly kind of expected um, to kind of take in, in regards to managing their own mental health. I think that's a really good point that you raised, Josephine, that part of this discussion, I think, needs to be an acknowledgement that not only do companies and platforms um, need to be more mindful of, of how they support esports athletes and streamers, but also how do we also support the streamers and the athletes themselves in that kind of capacity role? I, that's all I wanted to add on that. And sorry, I know Brian wanted to jump in with something. Yeah, I, it's just um, today and tomorrow we've been talking, uh, uh, sorry, today and yesterday we've been talking a lot about mental health and esports. And it feels like, and quite rightly so, because there's a lot of research that needs to be done, that, but it feels like we're all focusing on the negative light and how esports affects people's mental health. But 
what we're not talking about is how esports can actually be a positive for mental health and especially like esports is one of the most like it should be one of the most inclusive industries in the world because it doesn't matter what gender you are what age you are if you have a disability um all these factors don't matter everyone in esports plays in a level playing field like and it's one i i honestly think esports is one of the most inclusive environments in the world and one advantage that we've got as an industry is that if you think about video games video games are only 40 years old like maybe even 30 years old if you want to take like video our video game industry takes the model that nintendo used with the nes basically the exclusive model and there's been variations in that but it is still the model we use today so very like vi video games themselves are only 30 years old and esports is in its infancy so we have this opportunity, and especially in Scotland, actually, because um, in Scotland, esports is actually in the third sector. Like, there's no big business or anything in um, Scottish esports. Everyone does it for the social impact of the love of the scene. And there's that opportunity to actually tackle these issues from the ground up instead of playing catch up like a lot of other industries have done. And yeah, I just, the positives of esports and mental health like it's been proved that playing sports improves your mental health like it's and it's the same for esports and one example i've got of just how amazing this can be for people is uh, a social enterprise in scotland called viarama and <clears throat> they go into schools and care homes with vr with the intent to do social impacts and one of their case studies which i can share is when they went to a primary school and they worked with primary one to threes who had additional needs and they basically went in with their VR headsets and they sort of, they friendly and they worked really carefully with the kids to make sure they were comfortable with their VR headsets. And there was one kid that they talk about in the case study that was um, on, it was heavily autistic on the spectrum. He had very bad social skills. He couldn't look at people in the eye. He couldn't talk. They got, they put the VR headset on him and within like a day or two, he was saying, oh, I want to play Minecraft. I want to go over there. He was interacting with people like they'd never seen before and the entire case study was a 100 percent success rate with these kids and this is only one aspect of how esports and video games can be a positive thing on mental health you've also got stuff like cognitive disorders as well i was at a webinar a couple of weeks ago a couple of months ago it was a social enterprise webinar about um cognitive disorders and the women at it um actually put a spin on it, the same spin I'm trying to do in a positive way and how people that are autistic or have ADHD can actually get jobs and work in society and she asked us to all go round and there was about eight people at this webinar, some from like charities that actually deal with mental health and she asked us name a job that someone with autism can not only do but excel in and there was people on this panel that couldn't answer, they couldn't think of a job. And I'm sitting there in esports thinking, what five careers in esports am I actually going to talk about here? And the one I talked about was an observer. Um, so in esports, you get observers that stand behind people while they're playing, but you also get observers that sit in uh, control rooms and just look at data from the game. Like all this line of data just going like that. And what they're looking for is that one's three milliseconds out that one didn't go off in time that one and people that are autistic i know people that are autistic that have full-time jobs doing this like and it's just one aspect of esports that can be like very positive for mental health and obviously the community element as well it brings people together like no other industry does quite frankly and yeah it's something i'm really passionate about is yeah there is a lot of issues but you also need to look at the flip side as well about all the positives that it brings to so many people like like just look at last year with lockdown like i i escaped into like assassin's creed odyssey last year like and it's it's an all right game but it just it helped me get through lockdown and i'm pretty sure millions of people all around the world did the exact same thing as well yeah i just wanted to echo that from another kind of program that we have at the dad all at um, I kind of wasn't really expecting it to be so relevant, but um, you brought up men mentorship. And I think when we were sort of thinking about today, we reached out to some of our facilitators and one of them actually had a really lovely account of um, when they kind of pair their mentors and their mentees together, they sort of think, okay, how can we build that trusting relationship quickly at the beginning? And their sort of mutual love of gaming was something that they could really kind of pull together. And I think 
you know, as you sort of said, this is a quite a new field, really. And but actually, there's this kind of intergenerational shared love of it. But actually, the young people can see that they can they can really share with their older mentors their kind of perspectives, their kind of interests, like their advice for how to kind of progress in the games. And it really brought that um, relationship together. And, and in the mentoring space, fostering that kind of initial bond, that trust has kind of been shown to be such a key moment in kind of progressing. And I think esports kind of clearly captures people in, in that way. And I really wanted to ask actually, the, um, kind of talking about mentorship in the board and kind of creating that shared values. We obviously really stress in our anti-bullying program, the power of the peer and, and young people really supporting each other to sort of model good behavior, you know, call it out when they see it, support people who maybe are, are targets of any online bullying behavior. But from kind of your perspective in this kind of safeguarding forum, like what other, sort of what, how could a mentor best support potentially a young person coming up through this field? It, it really kind of ties our two programs together of that kind of peer support, but also the, what makes a good mentor. So I'm really curious to hear people's perspectives on that. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> um, yeah, um, mentorship is very important in esports. Like I started esports six years ago, and uh, I've been gaming since I was five, so I, I know the industry a bit well. Like, but yeah, esports specifically, I started six years ago, and I, I didn't start as a player. I went straight in as an esports manager in a grassroots esports org called Perilous Gaming. The it's not active now, but um, I. I got mentored like very well at the start of my career from uh, Mick and Gump at Perilous Gaming and also just the amazing people at Epic LAN as well, which is what all these are. I have to give them a shout out. <laughs> like, um, and yeah, they use the community model in esports and the community model is, um, it, it should be more popular, quite frankly. And the community model is based around mentorship and it's, it's based around the love of the scene, basically, and sort of distilling those community um ethos into people and sort of trying to yeah do it right and it is very difficult to sort of like keep your focus on the community and keep your focus on the players but yeah if you can sort of distill that into people as sport does as well like obviously people get into sport for um various reasons but i think most people do it because they love the sport that they do and that's one of the most important things i think with mentorship is to find mentors that love esports and love it for all the right reasons and want to distill that and want to be transparent as well like we were talking about transparency earlier and esports is a very sort of closed off like i i talk about giving people a peek behind the curtain a lot of the times like and that's what it feels it feels like you sort of pull the curtain back and people can see like what what's happening behind the scenes because there is that disillusionment and yeah mentoring is very important but it's finding those right mentors and that i think that comes from sort of regulation really more than anything yeah i'll, I'll jump in on that one yeah no i, I completely agree like it, it, it's such a young industry right and we always say that but we continue to feel the effects and we'll continue to feel the effects of that fact um we get we have our we run the clutch which is our pitch investment competition at, at esi right so we get sent through a lot of pitch decks from um fairly early stage startups and a lot of the times we see um the same issues and problems again and again and ultimately uh, one consistent point is that there's a lot of good ideas out there and there's a lot of passionate people with these good ideas um the design side the graphic side all of that it often looks very nice but scratch the surface and what investors actually want to see is often not really there and sometimes that's the case that it's a very early stage startup and they're pre-revenue whatever but oftentimes even when they aren't what investors need to see isn't there and again that comes down to the mentorship right like they a lot of the times especially with these sports teams it's run by people in what they're uh, the 20s, I know a few teams in the UK that are run by by kids, right? Like teenagers in their in their mid to late teens. And like all respect to them. Like I love it. I love the hustle. I love the drive. Like, I certainly wasn't doing that at that age. But they're who do they turn to? Like, who do they go to to ask these sort of questions to even know that what's missing 
should be there like not to know how to frame what's missing but to even know what to put in in the first place and i think that comes down to to mentorship in a in a big big way both from people that know and understand the esports space for sure but also people from outside the space like i i myself would still love <laughs> a, a mentor from uh, the investment or business world to um, to help me guide a bit better, like ESI's strategy as as we grow. Um, so for sure, I think that's a that's a huge issue, but a huge opportunity for the space as well. Yeah. W once again, I think this ties on for a, a, an issue that's I think um, bigger than than necessarily this. Mentor mentorship is important in all aspects of life. You know, from uh, a f family perspective, then growing on. You know, to kind of early on in your uh, um, academic career and then later on in your professional career, right? Having the right people to talk to, having those support groups, not just, you know, um, from a mentor specifically, but, you know, surrounding yourself with the people who will at the end of the day contribute positive to your life is, is super important, right? Um, I think it's very interesting to see once again how this paradigm shifted, right? Uh, most of us are still from a time prior to the internet, right? Where this used to happen, you know, and the, the groups of people that you used to meet were pretty much based around your school or activities that you did, right? And I think the the, the, the big shift in that is that we're no longer um, tied down to a geographic location or your proximity circle within your city or the activities that you're doing, right? Those still happen and that's great, but now the communities leave or live, sorry, on um, Discord, on Reddit. So, so uh, the, the, it's so incredible to see, even during lockdown once again, and uh, which Ryan touched on, and I think it's very pertinent, is seeing those still group of people still interacting on a daily basis without actually being f physically sharing the same location, right? Uh, I mean, I'll give my case. I'm originally from Portugal and I'm now in the UK. I still interact with friends who I, I used to interact on a daily basis now online. Uh, probably not daily anymore, but, you know, at least once or twice a week on Discord, right? Um, and even with people from, you know, who I used to play games with, um, who I don't play as many games with because I don't have time, but, you know, I'm still, uh, I finished work and I hop on Discord and I know what's happening and I kind of, and, and another thing that I think is even more interesting there is that we now have the ability to, uh, it always seemed strange to watch other people play, um, but it's something that I've done from a very young age, which is just seeing other people play games, you know, and having that interaction, even if you're not being active at something, being passive, but still engaging with them. And I think those communities now live uh, you know, on a, on a virtual sense in a way. So Discord is very important for this. And it's something that we know when even dealing with brands and and, 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 and a specific communities, understanding like that they live now on Discord or Reddit. And these are the main ones, Twitter as well to an extent. But, and this is where people interact. This is where people exchange ideas and having, you know, the ability to select the right people to kind of, you know, have in your in your friendship or in your proximity circle is very important for you to be able to identify the, those mentorships. At the end of the day, uh, and to kind of summarize, I think it's also a problem of the nascent type of the industry, right? There's a lot of nowadays things evolve in a very fast way, as opposed to, I'd say, um, 30, 40 years in. Uh, evolution has always been, you know, relatively constant, but now it start, starts to be, I think, a lot more exponential, uh, mainly with with the, the showing up of the internet and, and a lot of digital technology. So, you know, um, this causes people to have to adapt quite quickly and, and to in, engage in a different way. So finding mentors for this kind of new um, industry has, as Sam also mentioned it, they end up being, you know, and uh, we have team owners who are early, early twenties, you know, uh, or early thirties or late twenties. And, and they're the ones who now owns several of the biggest organizations in the world. Right. So finding those people with more experience, it's, it's, it has to come from outside of this industry and, and finding themselves, you know, from this business side or, you know, other more traditional sports and having those people mentorship, mentor the ones from the sports and the new digital entertainment side. And that's going to then have, once again, the ripple down effect when those people in 20 years, they'll be mentoring the new, the new edge one and so on and so forth. Emma, I've seen you have your webcam on for a little bit. Is there something that you wanted to chip in with? Yeah, I was wondering if I might just pick up on something that started early. Um, that started off this one. And it's not just heard here. You hear this regularly around about when you're talking about esports. I often hear that esports has this resources problem or that it's young or it's just going to take time. And, you know, looking at who's sitting here today and what we've talked about yesterday as well, and I'm looking at um, yeah a couple of yesterday's comments on, on esports, 
We've got mega gambling groups, media conglomerates, and major platforms. When I talked to Tencent, they couldn't remember which billion they were in that quarter. Uh, the GEF, which is the new uh, uh, global esports federation that's driven heavily by industry Olympic folks, uh, they picked up Ronaldo as a one time celebrity endorsement. Um, I'm wondering why we keep using this sort of language that esports is 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 young and not there yet when there's clearly an economic backdrop um and rather why aren't we asking who's responsible and do we have an accountability problem and just to add on that we are asking everything of the players who make everything for esports we are and complexity gaming counter-strike they are 25 year olds by now you know miners in australia are getting are getting accused of match fixing as has been discussed we expect them to act like adults as 16 year olds why aren't we expecting esports institutions with heavy economic backdrops to act like adults so i understand a, a lot of the on the ground pressures that we're talking about but at the same time there's like there's got to be some stage where we say responsibility and accountability the the someone's got to take it and it's and it doesn't have to be the players first because they take the brunt of professionalization um so i appreciate everything that's being said but i mean esports has been around long enough it's it's not the player's job to to do self-care um I'll, that's a great point. I'll just jump in there emma you're completely right um by the way there is an accountability problem in esports um and it gets put onto the players it gets put onto these young people that and I've seen it like when I was in the grassroots, like I, I've managed young grassroots players, and yeah, I it's just it's something that I really I I quite hate in this industry. I actually I'll admit, like it's probably not the best thing to admit, but um, yeah, people aren't held accountable the way they should, and I've I I personally think it's because of sectors, like it's because in the private sector, the people that control these sports are the people with the money with the power that can sort of hide in the shadows almost and can actually pass the buck down that organization to those people to even to right to the end to those players like and it's uh, players don't have a voice like um i <laughs> this is really weird to talk about but um about a month ago the sch board actually formed like and i actually felt i had a voice in my industry for the first time like, and it was empowering. Like, I actually went a bit off the rails. <laughs> I'll say, like, like, I'm back. I'm back to normal now. But just having feeling like I had a voice in my scene, and I've chatted to so many people in Scottish esports, and all anyone wants in this country in esports is to have a voice, is to have an opinion in their scene. And yeah, I, I actually, I put out a Twitter video on my own video asking to be held accountable because right now in esports, because there is very in Scotland anyway no governance, no regulation. The only court you have in, e in esports is the court of public opinion, which is Twitter and social media and stuff. That's where you get judged, basically, and it should not be like that. Like, there should be regulation, there should be governance, there should be protection for all, not just for the players as well, but for the ops staff, for the support staff, for everyone, like. And it's going to be hard to do that globally, but I'm really hoping that... Um, I, I, with all the work that I've done in Scottish esports, that I can act, that SEH can actually help what you were talking about here, and yeah, it's something I care a lot about. Like, and yeah, you're completely correct as well. There, I will, Another I will, I will Brian, agree. I think Brian, you made a really good point. In, in, sorry, Stephen, I'll, I'll just uh, defer to you, and then I'll finish off. Um, if you want to jump in. Oh, okay, great, thanks. I think Emma makes a good point. Um, that's that's exactly what we're what we're trying to do now. Um, so so we've basically got hold of these people with with deeper pockets, and we've said to them, "We'll we'll hold on." Um, surely, surely, you know, the benefit that that the industry is creating for you is 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 enough reason for you to to contribute to the sustainability of the industry at the most core and basic level, which is the protection of the player itself. Because the player is the industry, the player is the product, the player is the entertainment. But but more and more than all of that, the player is the human. Um, so so um, having those discussions with these larger players, these 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 uh, bigger stakeholders, like including some of the people that Emma mentioned, but also some very highly commercialized old companies that that have a, a really decent skin skin in the game. Um, 
and, and you know what we're, we're getting some some great buy-in and unfortunately we, we've had to force the hand of industry somewhat uh, and the way we've done that is is simply bringing government into the discussion and saying to government well look here's empirical proof that 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 this is an issue uh and then we've gone to industry and said well we'll look industry if, if you don't want government to come down with a with a overbearing hand of of regulation you got to come to the table as well and then we've we've kind of sat in the middle as as, as an almost impartial um body that doesn't necessarily have a vested interest in either side of that discussion uh, and said well how do we create a framework um that we can at least trial in one jurisdiction and then uh push out a, as and when it, it it looks like it's working um and, and that's been that's been discussion that's very very slow but nonetheless it's happening so uh if anybody's interested in in getting involved and lending their voice then they're more than welcome to because we're very uh finally resourced i think is the best way for me to put it i think our charity would always be happy to be part of any conversations like that that are going on and i would hope that um that consortium approach that collaboration between people who are experts in various areas and that we don't kind of forget about the intersectionality and about everything else as we're having uh, these conversations with big players.